On the internet, there's this video. It's from the early 1980s, and it's shot by an international medical group called Médecins du Monde, Doctors of the World. And it shows the rescue at sea of an overcrowded boat of Vietnamese refugees, families of men and women and children. And the boat's been on the South China Sea for some three days. It's been tossed by storms. And the boat's filled with a whole lot of people, many of whom had never even seen the sea before. And many of the people on board look either catatonic or beside themselves with terror. And it's amazing to watch the transformation of those people as they're pulled onto the larger boat and they begin to allow themselves to hope once more. Aunt Nguyen Austin was one of the kids on that boat. She was just six years old at the time. After her family was rescued, they went to the United States. Aunt worked really hard. She was admitted to an elite college where she earned a double degree. And now Aunt lives in Australia. She's an academic at the Australian Catholic University. And she's a volunteer with the At Speak, which is a community-based language group in inner West Melbourne. And she cooks for Free to Feed, an enterprise that supports refugees and asylum seekers in Australia. And it was only a few years ago that Arne saw that dramatic and powerful footage of the rescue of her family at sea. Hello, Arne. Hi, Richard. When you cook at this place, Free to Feed, what do you cook? Oh, I cook this actually uh, Tex-Mex Vietnamese menu, uh, which is uh, kind of a flair of all the places that I kind of grew up. How does that work, Tex-Mex and Vietnamese? A lot of chilli, obviously, is the connecting ingredient there, I would think. Uh, no, it's actually the fresh herbs and the cilantro. So I think of them both as very fertile and fruit-oriented vegetable cuisines, very fresh. Tell me about the town where your family lived when you were little. Well, we grew up in, I grew up in Bien Hoa, um, and it's a very Catholic town. It's about 20 so minutes outside of Saigon, which is Ho Chi Minh City now. And it's so Catholic that I took my son back there, and we discovered that people have been visiting the statue of Mary where she's bleeding tears out of her eyes. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so we're, we're like, how does it work? How does it work? <laughs> yeah. And what is this town? Is it, a, is it an agricultural town? What, what is, what's going on in this town? It's actually a lumber-based town, and uh, my grandfather had inherited that business. So there you see a lot of furniture making, and then you see a lot of nuns and priests and, you know, I live at the house around the corner from the church, really. Was your family relatively well-to-do then before the communist takeover in the 70s? Uh, yes, because of my grandfather, he had the luck of um, inheriting this business and town kind of industry. Um, he was a young man in his 20s at the time, after the 50s, after the French war. And there was a man who was a very wealthy landowner who basically wanted to get rid of all the assets that was in his portfolio at the time before communism comes. And so he really took a liking to my great-grandfather. And so he, he gave him business. So how much protection did that wealth and status afford your family in the town that while the war is raging throughout the 50s and 60s and early 70s between the North and South? Um, well, it gave my father certainly um, a lot of protection and he was still kind of drafted to do military service, but his father was able to um, have him only stay in the office and take an office position so he never had to go to the front line. So my father had the opportunity to um, do his baccalaureate, French baccalaureate, for instance, by post, and one of the last to do that. How did your parents meet? Oh, my parents, um, they met in um, 1970. As I understand it, see, my mother went to boarding school and everyone went to some kind of Catholic school and my father went to seminary. And there was a nun visiting her town. She lives in the country near the coast. And the nun had noticed her and then um, mentioned 
to my father's family, there's a really nice girl here. And um, and so they send my grandfather to go and meet her. And then the grandfather's kind of created the courtship. So there was a matchmaker involved. There's, this, there's a whole culture of that, isn't there? Yes, and mostly around the families and the two grandfathers. So my grandfather was very fond of my, my parents' marriage, and he remembers it exactly. The courtship is six months and nine days. How did they get on? Oh, they got on really well. Um, my father was very debonair and very handsome and very uh, learned and sophisticated. So when he kind of arrived at the door, kind of walked out, and he's quite tall because he had some French blood in him and came to meet her, you know, her father told her right away, just put on something nice and go out and bring out the tea. And then um, he did also give them time. I think he, they sent the two of them to the second floor and they got to talk. And my mother was very impressed with his conversation and sophistication. So did they court together for a while, go out, and did they end up falling in love, even though it was an arranged marriage? Oh, yes. My father was a very romantic, um, very French-influenced person. So the courtship is really just uh, lots of letters. He wrote a lot of letters, and from what my mother said, they only got like one day trip together in um, Bari, which is near Vungtau, uh, very... Um, popular tourist town now. So that was around that. And then otherwise, she just had lots of letters from him and he would write about um, walks in the woods and he had all these stories and kind of very romantic prose. Was this in French or Vietnamese that he was writing in? Uh, I think he would have written in Vietnamese to my mother. Um, she didn't probably know as much English as he did. So when they got married, how did it go for your mum when she moved into the family home. Yeah, I asked her about that and she said that, you know, she never met them and she didn't know. Um, so she became kind of the the new person or kind of a bit of the housemaid in the family. And she she did struggle a little bit with my um, grand or, or the grandmother who was very demanding. And uh, she didn't know what she was in for, but um, later, you know, that grandmother on her deathbed asked for my mother. So I think despite some difficulties, they ended up quite fond of one another. What was your dad doing for work in those years? So he just would go to the office, the army office, and then he would bring his studies. And then that was what his main job was. And he was kind of completing that baccalaureate then. And he would bring the little treats back to her. He knew he, she was struggling a bit. So he would find petite fours and they would have some quality time on their own. And um, later when um, he had um, my brother, they had their first child, he decided to insist that they um, get a separate home so that they wouldn't have to live in uh, with the grandparents. Still a married couple who are Catholic in Vietnam, having petit fours and tea and everything else. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It feels a bit like St. Petersburg just before the Russian Revolution. That's something, oh, you know, it feels yeah. like, I, I know, I just sort of feel the fragility of this as you're telling me this. Aunt. Yeah, it is 1970. And, um, you know, so they are struggling actually to have children. And they go to the priests and they ask about this. And um, you can sense the post-war Malays and the priest turns to them and says, you know, look around at all the poverty and suffering around you. I don't think your concerns of that much of magnitude in the world. And, you know, so they go away and then finally they get um, a first child, which is good. And then um, by the time it's 1976, right after the fall of Saigon is the year that I'm born. So I think they proceeded in a way um, despite the war. So 1976 is after the U.S. has pulled out that dramatic scene of everyone climbing aboard the chopper on top of the U.S. embassy in Saigon. That's all been and gone. And now mm. uh, the Communist Party has control of the entire country. What did that mean for your Catholic, slightly Frenchified family under the new regime? 
Well, there's certainly that sense that we were uh, property owners and that um, our fortunes would change. But it was just pure chaos um, for everyone. And specifically for my mother's family, um, they were living on the coast. So when the U.S. Navy had left and evacuated, they all got to go on those Navy ships. So her entire family... Um, had evacuated and were headed to the U.S. But she lived inland because she had married my father, and so there was no way for her to go. So she heard news of that. But it was kind of constant news about people leaving. And um, even, you know, my father's family was extremely sad for her, and I think they became much kinder to her in in that sense. Um, But it was one of the saddest days. There were, you know, people that remember the exact hour of the radio announcement and um, South Vietnamese soldiers committing suicide. Um, It's just a very, like, even when my mother talks about it, she really tears up at that very particular hour. They remember that hour. Was your family going to be a target of this regime, like I said, though, given the fact they're bourgeois Catholics? Yes, I guess we'd grown up with some raids on the house. They were, you know, checking for weapons or whatever it is that they're saying they're doing. But mostly it's just confiscating property. How about the big house that your grandfather had? What did the regime want to do with that? Uh, Well, I think what happened is people's fortunes had changed. So they kind of left us just a very small part of the shop front. And so they had given the other parts away to other families um, that were probably working for the regime. Were your parents sent to re-education camps? No, my father did not have that kind of a fate um, because he was protected by his family. And how was he protected? Were they, did they have connections with the regime or was it just through, I don't know, paying off soldiers or how did it work? Yeah, life in that kind of a town was, um, it, you know, they had a lot of influence, but Um, It wasn't the way we see um, an us and them, you know, Um, your your neighbors, um, if they had were working for Viet Cong or um, it wasn't clearly um, adversarial. We just kind of accepted that people had political uh, leanings merely for survival. And so there wasn't that sense of um, division so to speak. And in that countryside, you're in one of the most beautiful places in the world too, aren't you, with all that colour and and scent and all those other things that are going on. It's it's a kind of a, it is so beautiful, Vietnam, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, well, I just took my son back maybe two years before COVID and I'm walking down the dusty streets and, um, you know, I walk into this convenience store and the man in the convenience store, he knows me, recognizes me right away. And this is, you know, I'm in my 40s now. What do you mean? You mean from your childhood? Yes, he recognized me from um, Fu Lang as the child. But he did know of our family and he knew of our journey. And he also talked about that he would have been one of the passengers, um, but but he'd pulled out at the end. Like I say, this was a there was a lot of turmoil in Vietnam at, at this time in the late seventies. Did you still manage to have a happy childhood, nonetheless, in the midst of all this? Oh, definitely. I think that um, I had a very protective childhood. I had a lot of um, my cousins to play with, and I had all these aunties and extended family. Um, my favorite cousin and I, you know, would go around and. Um, apparently, he taught me how to walk and run. You know, we would go chasing flies, you know, <laughs> using plastic bags. And uh, um, supposedly, we also, you know, would catch bees and tie them on strings and go out and dance in the rain when it rained really heavily. How would you tie strings to a bee? I don't really know. <laughs> and so, yeah, in my in my imagination of it all, I'd be like, well, we'd take out the stinger and then we would, you know, like, you know, immobilize the leg. <laughs> and then, you know, it was just something that um, we did. And we also created these little kind of beaded critters. And we also have uh, cricket fights. You know, you would aggravate the cricket with um, a little wand that you made from your hair. And then, and then they would attack each other. It was kind of like cockfighting, but with crickets. That sounds yeah. wonderful. What do, you, what do you tell your own son about all that stuff? Oh, uh, actually, I haven't told him much about that. Anyways, I don't think he knows to ask. 
when I took him back, he learned to love the street foods, and that was plenty enough. It sounds idyllic, this childhood, in a funny way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a way, I think it was very protective those first six years for me. Um, and uh, some some the children that I've interviewed that are also refugees that resettled here in Australia have talked about some of the idyllic um, childhood and perceptions even when they're in the refugee camps. So you say you had family that had gone to America. Were they able to make contact with your family in Vietnam? No, you didn't get anything. Um, so I think my mom said that by the time I was born was when she got the first letter that told her that her parents were in America and that they were safe. So that was, you know, 1976, and they would have left in 75. How were they getting on in America? Um, my grandmother um, was, again, resettled, um, the whole family. You know, there were nine other children, and uh, they settled in a place called Versailles, uh, which is outside of New Orleans. But um, she just started getting on with life. She put on a yoke. She made this Vietnamese ham yaw, and um, she put it into the yoke and sold it at the church. And then she eventually, you know, built a whole factory to make this ham and that money created the starter money for all her children and their businesses. Were they able to send you presents from America? Yeah, I was very fond of the penny and um, but my favorite thing is this uh, doll, a blonde blue-eyed doll that I was very attached to and um, I would carry it everywhere. It's in every picture with me. Um, I remember distinctly this cameraman coming to take a picture to send to my grandparents to show them and uh, the doll is there. And then there's my sister, and she was like the new living doll when she was born. <laughs> so that was really exciting as well. So meanwhile, your parents were planning to escape and get away. You were little. Did you have any idea that there were plans afoot to leave? No, um, I didn't even know this until much later that my father had attempted several escapes uh, in different combinations with... Um, you know, uh, his own brothers, you know, there were these different configurations and uh, they obviously failed. And so they came to the decision that because it was hard to get passage for a family with children that they just had to buy, um, buy and build their own boat to escape. To buy and build their own boat? Mm. Under the nose of the authorities? Yes. Yeah, so... Um, he got a group of family members and friends together, and um, we had to pay the living of a fisher family um, that were living near the coast, and they would kind of house the building of the boat. And then we put together, you know, the mechanic and the the navigator, an ex, you know, Navy person. And um, everything in the year's time was um, planned to build this boat that would be... Um, the fishing boat, kind of just presumably going out for the morning fish. My God, your father must have been so resourceful. I mean, getting hold of all the mechanical parts for an engine and the timber and the frame and just finding the shipwrights who can build the thing. I mean, this must have been quite a large conspiracy that's been hatched to build this big boat. Well, it was. In fact, you know, um, my mother would go into the city and her family had had kind of a petrol uh, company. So she actually brought different engine parts home. And uh, they would have done all this and we wouldn't have known anything about it. We were just, uh, you know, sitting by the well and looking at the goldfish. So who was going to join your family on this big boat that was being built? Well, it's only family and uh, family friends and cousins because it was all kept in secret. And again, you know, the key is never to talk about any of the plans because the fear that you would be interrogated later. So even when you, um, when I later meet my cousin, my favorite cousin that I grew up with, um, he was shocked to see me because he wasn't ever told what happened to me or where we went. So with all that, when it was time to go, what do you remember of that day or night when your parents said, we're leaving this town? Well, I... 
I presume that I got to take my doll. And I remember um, distinctly, my father had a motorbike and there's a sidecar. And so I got to drive and sit in the sidecar. And um, we would have been told that we were visiting an auntie um, on the coast. And uh, we went out that night. Um, I don't think I would have known anything was amiss, uh, except that when we probably got to the house and um, it's time to kind of walk through the marsh to get to the boat. So at that point, um, I even remember that my sister was talking about, you know, the Viet Cong and um, being scared. And were you scared? You were scared at that point. I think I was. I was definitely scared. Um, I was walking with my auntie, and then my mother was holding on to my sister, and then my brother was walking with my father. Um, and there were checkpoints, you know, where um, I would see guards, and then my father would have to bribe or negotiate with them, and. Um, and then we just kind of walk through. And in a child's mind, you know, it's a jungle to me. <laughs> and, you know, it's large and scary and dark and very wet. Um, so it it was not fun anymore. So, Oh, Anna, knowing what was at stake for your parents, they've got their whole family, you've got their kids around them. They must have been... They must have been so frightened. And did you sense that about them at the time or were they trying to trying to keep that under wraps for your sake. Well, I think the beautiful thing about childhood memory that it protects you and so you kind of only get flashes or kind of reconstructions from um, their telling of events. So I don't remember the immediate fear of it, but I certainly remember some of the scary parts of the journey. What did your parents tell you about going to the edge of the water? Oh, so my mom, um, you know, thinking about it now, she she made a lot of sense. Maybe she um, knew how children's imaginations worked, but she told me that there are ghosts in the water and that I shouldn't go to the edge because they would, like, claw their way up and grab you and you would drown. <laughs> so it was a very good way of telling you not to go to the edge. Could you swim in those days? No, most people really didn't swim. And um, I definitely, you know, have known a lot of Vietnamese with uh, swimming phobias. Um, I myself could probably pass the test for college, but um, in no way was that a natural thing. So a lot of people struggled and some drowned before they even got onto boat. Were there plenty of people who'd never seen the water before? Yeah, there were so many people that were hiding in the, um, the marsh and that had jumped on. You know, our boat was designed for about 40 people. It's about 10 meters by 2.5 meters. And then um, people were hiding and they had jumped on. Um, the people that we had uh, paid to build the boat had sold passages to other people. So that's how it got to this mass number of 101 people instead of 40 as planned. Oh, right. From 40 to 101 people? Yeah. 101 people on a 10, you know, 9.5 is what it was reported at. But, um, and then by 2.5. And then by the time we get to the boat, you know, I suddenly lose sight of my parents and just squeeze down to the bottom of the deck. And um, it's kind of suffocating. And, and I can see that um, closing of the, the hatch and then just waiting and then suddenly seeing my father open it and then pulling me out, you know. But it was a very, um, something you had to do before the 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 ship actually came out to the water. Did your father Did your father talk about, given that, I mean, he paid for this and these extra people were going to put all your lives at risk. Did he consider trying to force these extra people off? No, I think um, my father and um, the people that organized with us uh, that were families uh, were very um, Catholic in the sense that they felt that our fates were tied and um, we weren't going to um, push people off. You know, there was a bit of mutiny. People had paid and said that we should, you know, club them off um, from the boat because they were clinging on. But my parents said, 
no, they decided not that we would launch and we would just kind of share in our fates together. Where were you put on the boat? Um, eventually, when I was pulled out of the under cabin, I was in the top little cubby. And somehow in my child's mind, I remember like a little light globe that, you know, was very preoccupying for me. It was probably the most exciting thing to look at. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you have to hide from the water patrols, from the authorities? Yeah, when we launched out inadvertently, we had gone to where the police patrols are. So we kind of went to the wrong place that day. Like, you know, all the plans to go this way or that way and head for the Philippines had gone away. But I think luckily what happened was like the police patrol people had already gone out to look for boats to bring back. And somehow they weren't in that area. So we were the only ship that day that got out. Podcast, broadcast, and online. You're listening to Conversations with Richard Feidler. Find out more about the Conversations podcast. Just head to abc.net.au slash conversations. Now, where were you headed? Where was the boat aiming to, to land? Um, well, we were hoping to get to the Philippines. And as it turned out, what happens, because I've been able to kind of find the footage and also do a little um, hind casting in historical wave data. At the time our boat was in the water, um, there was magnificent storms that were of a magnitude, you know, that happen every 100 years. So we were struggling with those waves. So by the second day at sea, these huge waves had already flooded the engine. So we were really drifting. So there was no way that we were going to make it to our trajectory towards the Philippines. We were just floating. Did you just say there was a one in 100 year storm that hit your boat? Well, no. What happens is this storm, you know, the, the, the waves that are forming are about like 60 meters long and then three meters high. And so whenever those waves are coming, they would just smash into the boat and, and then they would flood the engine. And so we never even hit the eye of the storm. So it was almost as if by the magnitude of this storm, we, we never get to the core of it. If we got to the core of it, we would have died for sure. But then somehow that the waves and the engine cutting off drifted us to the rescue point where La Goyo was, which is the rescue boat from with the Medicine du Monde. Do you remember that storm? I don't remember the storm. I really um, kind of um, had to reconstruct that when I interviewed um, the family and my parents in Paris, because most of our ship members uh, all resettled in Paris due to the visas that were given by the French government from Médecins du Monde. And uh, every year the group celebrates as a Catholic mass this miracle of rescue and then uh, a memorial to those that drowned and other boats that drowned. So a lot of that time I spent trying to ask about all the logistics and what had happened. And then I was able to bring it back to researchers at the University of Melbourne who could do the historical modeling of um, conditions of sea at the time and likelihood of survival. So when you tracked down those, your, those people who were your fellow passengers, what did they tell you about that storm? Oh, well, they recall, you know, the waves being six metres tall. You know, it would have looked like such a wall of water. There was no way to tell. And there was this kind of um, exhaustion of hope and, you know, a series of prayers. There was just uh, no sense that we would make it. So when they saw the rescue ship on the horizon, they almost feared that it might be pirates, you know, coming to attack us. I think they were getting more and more hopeless. But it was quite miraculous that people came out to rescue us. Do you remember seeing that boat? I don't remember seeing that boat, but I know that my father certainly remembers it. 
And it was quite uh, like to them, they recited, you know, like on the third day, there was this ship on the horizon, you know, and, you know, we had exhausted all the prayers to Mary and Joseph and everyone else. So The way you say it, it does sound like a Bible passage. It sounds it like some people lost in the wilderness. Yeah, they were quite biblical. Yeah, and you'll find that kind of uh, zealous Catholicism and that narrative um, amongst Vietnamese in diaspora. So you were found, this rescue boat that found you, it was a boat from Médecins du Monde, uh, mm. Doctors of the World. Who are Doctors of the World? Are they like uh, Médecins Sans Frontières? Yeah, they were a fraction of um, Médecins Sans Frontières. Uh, basically, they were committed to kind of always being um, where the immediate needs and dangers were. And so they kind of separated from um, Médecins Sans Frontières, which wanted to kind of establish more stable bases in order to help people. So later... Medicine Dumont were kind of the doctors that wanted to go front line on any event. And there was a young Vietnamese doctor on that boat. He was about in his early 20s and he'd finished medical school in Paris. He'd been sent out as a teen and he's part of that rescue. And so the reason I found this footage and information is by finding him. And that's how I uh, was able to recover this history. Like I say, when I saw that footage of the Médecins du Monde boat pulling up against your boat mm. in, what's this, 1982. Everyone, everyone's sort of lying on the deck there on that boat, that overcrowded boat. The grown-ups look catatonic. Yeah. They look terrible. They're in terrible shape. Um, do you have any idea what that state of mind is like? I can't, I can't read it very well. I've never been that in a situation as dire as that. What's going on there, do you think? Well, there are two things, the exhaustion of hope, but there's also this feeling that we finally getting rescued. And I remember looking at the boat and how big the rescue boat was. And in a child's mind, it's huge. And that fishing net is huge. And I thought, wow, if we are going to have to climb that net, there's just no energy, no energy at all to finally we're going to die at this moment of exhaustion. But then, you know, in that footage, I'm just kind of lifted as a little child onto the rescue boat and other people had to climb that net to get on. But it was it was kind of a joyous, like adrenaline. And other uh, refugees have described the moment of rescue like they will never be that sad or hopeless again. Like nothing can match that level of despair. Hang on, in the moment of rescue, you feel that despair or the moment before it? Well, I think when they reflect upon it more so, but I think it's really hard to um, understand the the lethargy of losing so much hope along the way. I think the rescue is just like an adrenaline rush. I don't remember anything else that way. When I look at the footage, I can see the kids are just pinging around the, the deck. They're so happy. And the adults still look shocked. They still look like maybe they don't trust themselves to believe that they've been rescued. What do you think is going on there? Well, I think when you're at sea for those dark, dark nights and you haven't seen anyone, and I remember going to the lower deck and then seeing the other refugees, and you really understand yourself as part of this mass of suffering. And there were so many other refugees because we were the last hundred amongst the 400 that were already rescued and in the boat. And then you kind of understand your situation in that context. And you really like are kind of um, thrown back in thinking, wow, like we're part of this huge condition and we don't know how to go about believing that, you know, what will be next. If you're one of those adults like your parents and the other adults on board and you've dared everything to get on that boat and you've been out at sea for three days, you've lived through a storm, the engine's conked out and, and then you're rescued from that. I just wonder how that affects the way you see the world forever afterwards. Since you've hit that awful rock bottom pit of despair, that blackest kind of despair, I wonder if that makes you so damn strong afterwards or does it scar you? What do you think? Well, a lot of the research interviews and oral histories I've done, people really take it as a point of strength and a sense of like a post-traumatic growth moment that you never, you never suffer in that way again. And nothing could be that despairing or hopeless. So different people experience it in different ways. But overall, I think the majority of certainly children perspectives as refugees are extremely 
hopeful and forward looking. So if you think about it, for the children, such a big adventure. Me and my brother were very preoccupied after being sprayed in quarantine and everything with looking for dolphins, you know, or running around the ship. And this was like a cruise liner for all we knew, you know. <laughs> yeah. Do you think adults looked at children in that moment to see their, their happiness? I think they must have. Because, you know, there's a lot of risk and a lot of people's justifications for that level of risk is for their children. So no matter how despairing or how um, scared they are of the future, I think they see that it's worth it's worth a go. Um, my mother did talk about a moment of regret, you know, that she feared they'd made a mistake. Probably two days into being at sea, she would really thought, maybe I've just made a big mistake. So there are these kind of ambivalent moments, but I think going forward... They were pretty much counting on that future that they'd created for their children. I think if I'm that parent and I've been through all of that and the kids are safe on board and then I see one of my kids get excited and say, oh, look, look, a dolphin, a dolphin. Mm. I think that would be one of the most lovely things that I would have ever seen in my entire life to see my kid happy at looking at a dolphin. Yeah, there are very strong moments like that. Like um, even when we were in the camp, you know, when we arrive at the refugee camp, um, there's like a family running at us and they're like family friends and they had been in the camp and they'd heard that, you know, another ship was coming that we possibly could be on it. So they had already set up tent and everything for us. And, and those moments are very huge celebratory uh, relief for my parents to be recognized by others that um, were also fellow villagers and friends and families. What was the camp like Aunt, in the Philippines? Oh, this was Palawan and Bataan. And in those 70s, those camps were quite open. So you could go into town. You could buy little treats. You would go hang out at the beach. And uh, like my father really fell in love with the ocean. And you could see the fish through the water. It's a beautiful ideal location for scuba diving now but before when it was a refugee camp it had been intended for like um open air prison actually so it would be like the taranga zoo of refugee <laughs> camps it was just amazing yeah and given that it was the Philippines, was it a lot easier for your parents to be as Catholic as they wanted to be? Yes, I think they really, I mean, we're extremely fond of Filipinos. And every time we think about them giving us that first asylum, you know, the countries around Asia were giving a lot of first asylum and rescue. And um, they were growing exhausted of it by the 1980s. And that's when these other countries were like France and Germany were sending out ships to rescue. So your family got accepted by the United States as migrants and you flew to <laughs> the United States and eventually settled in Dallas, Texas. That must have looked so weird to you. What do you remember of that time? Yes. Well, imagine how strange it is to grow up there as a Vietnamese. And I was mistaken for being Spanish and because there were no other um, brown people in town. But I remember that flight and... A lot of it probably comes from my imagination with Texas history as well, because I can see from the plane the streets are lined in gold, kind of like that conquistador view of America. You know, it's so wealthy here. And all I can see upon landing is these golden lights. And I thought <laughs> it must be the richest place in the world. And then, you know, again, when we land, I see my cousins rushing at me and they're like, oh, do you want to try ice cream? And I'm like, yes, I want to try ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> it was so exciting. It was so exciting. So how hard were your parents working to make a new life in Texas? Um, my, my mother had decided that we would not um, resettle around New Orleans, and she followed a brother uh, that uh, was doing upholstery. So she went to train with him in Dallas, and that's what brought us to Dallas. Uh, there was no um, kind of training for this life for my parents. My father is what we call kind of white hands, you know, had not done a hard labor um, life before. So really my mother kind of took the reins and my father um, had attempted to build businesses like uh, we bought a gas station and they worked 24-7 and couldn't see the kids. And so my mother said, you know, I'm not going to do this. Um, let's do an upholstery shop. 
And he turned to her and he said, oh, well, you don't know enough English. <laughs> he said, and um, my mother's like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And they did. So they just uh, had a lot to go for in that kind of refugee entrepreneurship kind of way because you've got nothing to lose and therefore you've got everything to build. I mean, my mother had four kids under the age of nine in her early 30s. So... There was a lot to work for. A lot for you to work for, too. Mm. You, I mean, you went through high school and you were admitted to Bryn Mawr College. Now, this is one of the most super elite colleges, universities in the United States. Good God, how far you'd come. That's extraordinary. But what were the expectations on you like right, once you'd started going to Bryn Mawr? Uh, I didn't really think about um, college. I didn't even know that it was coming and I ticked off the boxes and... I even called it Brian Mayer, I think. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I ended up, you know, just arriving at this school and, you know, it was like a castle, blue stone castle. So most of my life has been kind of plunged into not really knowing what it is I'm in. But it's a very good upbringing at Bryn Mawr. It's a women's college. You know, Catherine Hepburn had gone there. Uh, we'd given men some access to education after the GI Bill and things like that. But for the most part, you were driven by your own um, vision and ambition. And you kind of grew up in this idyllic world where, well, feminism was a given. Like, you didn't even have to worry about anything else. What expectations did your mum, your very religious mum, have for you, though? Oh, my mom, um, I think they didn't really understand what I wanted to do, which was English literature. <laughs> um, there's always the the need to probably not go into poverty. But <laughs> I didn't bring you to Texas to become a poet. Was she telling no, you that? No, really. They, they knew I was very bookish and, you know, they feared that the romanticism um, would lead me into poverty. And I remember telling them, Mom, if I'm homeless, I could just go to the library and shower there. <laughs> yeah, and when they your mum recovered it. from the fainting spell after that. <laughs> I think when she's exasperated with me, she says, you're just like your father. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, if you're going to be careerist about it, I, you know, you, you ended up doing a master's in theology. Now, and it's, it's not like you could be pope or a bishop, is it? No. So, so were you <laughs> really that careerist when you did a master's in theology? I, I I had this nagging, you know, like if I was anything like my mother, I would be more career and I would be a good businesswoman. Um, and so, you know, even like going to women's college, I had looked at an article of Hillary Clinton and I had gone the other way, went to Bryn Mawr instead of Wellesley. But it just never came to fruition. I even went and interviewed for MetLife in New York City, you know, and I remember interviewing with them and then not being able to like hail a cab back to the airport because it was rainy and I thought there's no way I'm going to survive this city or this corporate life and um, I had felt already called to go to Harvard Divinity as a kind of a, um, a moral obligation and also fear of going into the real world but um, I, I tried being a nun and um, there was this kind of sense of vocation that I had to find in the world. So I wanted to figure it out, what the meaning of life is, or what was the meaning of life for me in terms of why was I not the drowned and why was I the saved um, was kind of my big personal question. Did you feel a moral obligation to your mum or to your God? Um, no, I felt a moral obligation to my family, um, which is extremely Catholic, so, you know, but I remember, you know, growing up, praying the rosary every day. And then even my mother saying, you know, one of you children should be given to God to thank for our journey. So that kind of laid the fabric in my mind. I don't think any of my brothers and sisters heard that, <laughs> that um, somehow I was to do that. How about the college itself? What did they expect of you? I mean, when, when they bring you into those American colleges, they don't expect you to go off and work as a, a junior official in the Department of Land Tax afterwards. They, 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 they really have high ambitions for you, and they really let you know all about that, don't they? Uh, they do. Uh, I, I'd gotten a lot of scholarships and lots of offers, and they had really brought me in for that. But, you know, I grew up in a very lucky time. They valued creativity and um, something called metacognition, and... Um, I did well there. You know, I was able to interview for a very top fellowship 
from the Thomas Watson at the end. And I remember just that Bryn Mawr gave you a lot of freedom to be creative. Like I wanted to go to Vietnam and do memoir, food writing, actually. And um, they gave me that every opportunity to, to find those things. So I didn't think it was a very it's not a very strenuous college in that sense. You really had to kind of find your own way and you're given every support possible, but they really wanted you to drive your own vision of the world. So and eventually you came to Australia and you now live in Melbourne with your son. Mm. How did you end up finding that film that's on the internet of the rescue of you and your family and all those other people from 1982? So I uh, was on a trip in London for some conferences and uh, I had been presenting these histories of refugees in Australia and their connection on Facebook with one another again, based on the camps that they were from, uh, the refugee camps, and then also the boats they were rescued. And I decided to throw this email out and this picture that my father had given me years back of the doctor and um, the boat. There's like a painting of the boat in it. And I sent it to a colleague uh, who happened to be a French professor at the University of Melbourne, and then she connected with the French Vietnamese that were in Paris, and immediately they recognized the doctor, and they said, um, why don't you stop in, in Paris, and you can have a meeting with him. So I met him, and uh, I was just kind of quietly stunned to meet this man who'd been a part of my childhood rescue. Have you been in a room with those other members of that group of refugees that was on that boat? Yes, so he, the doctor had told me that there was this annual um, celebration and mass. So it was later in 2019 that I decided to go and meet the others in the mass. But at the time, like maybe years back, because um, we were very close family friends of a family in Paris. I had kind of met the other children that had grown up with me during that time. So it was a little bit of um, a bit of a family reunion with our fellow boat people in Paris. And that was how that kind of historical excavation came about. Normally, on when I introduce a guest at the start and I explain what they do, it can pretty much be done in about 15 seconds or less. But again, I'm just saying here, that, I mean, <laughs> you work not only as an academic at the Australian Catholic University, but as a paralegal for Native Title Services Victoria. You volunteer with Viet Speak, this community-based language group, and you cook for Free to Feed, an enterprise to support refugees and asylum seekers. You're doing a lot of stuff here. Do you have a view on the shape of your life, given where you've come from, what you've been through and where you are now? I guess it sounds a bit gimmicky, but I think, you know, um, if you rise, you kind of bring people up with you. I think about that kind of very existential moment about um, being saved and how arbitrary it was my life versus, say, 200 to 500,000 other people that drowned. So I feel a tremendous uh, sense of obligation to others and uh, hence their stories and working with refugees and asylum seekers. But I want to do it on the side of joy and hope. And that's what the cooking is about, you know, just sharing stories about food and what I loved and what I um, remembered about uh, childhood in Vietnam and uh, cooking with my mother and then the traditions that my grandmother created through food and the livelihood that they created. Um, so it's a way of celebrating and honoring them. And uh, that work, when I got that work in um, Native Title, that was kind of my way of really getting a sense of belonging in Australia. So I was always kind of grateful for whatever opportunities came my way. But it seemed inextricable in that my story was uh, also part of other stories. And putting that into context through history has really kind of been meaningful for me. That moment when your dad refused to kick those other people off the boat, the people who hadn't paid for passage, who crowded onto the boat, who put everyone else's life at greater risk, that moment when he refused to kick them off mm. because it would be heartless to do so, do you think about that a lot? Yeah, my parents are in that way... Um, very altruistic and 
there's a little bit of madness with altruism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like mad hope or um so I think that I think that that there was no rationale, but kind of like um, the fuel of faith, you know. And, uh, you know, I don't mean to sound so missionary because I'm not really a great Catholic myself. But I think that that was what, by principle, um, their sense of the world and um, how it was going to happen was that we're going to make it or we were not going to make it, but all together. The great Czech writer turned president Václav Havel used to say that, who spent years as a political prisoner, he used to say that hope isn't the belief, it's not the belief that things are all going to turn out well in the end. He said it's the act of living authentically. Hmm, that's very profound indeed. I've been really privileged to kind of listen to people's lives and histories and um, I think always you kind of hear that awareness that they've really touched upon something that's very real. And you can hear that in their stories. And I think that's an interesting way of looking at it. And it's been so lovely speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.